Welcome. This is Ec Econ B2000 Introduction to Econometrics here at the Department of Economics and Business in the Colin Powell School at the City College. This is going to be fun. In this class, we're going to be using a computer program called R, and we're going to use R Studio, which sits on top of R. One of the very first things you've got to do is install these bad boys. So how do you do that? You go to the link that I just put up there and you follow the instructions. Step one, download and install R. Step two, download and install R Studio Desktop. Now, I can't give exact instructions since this depends on your operating system and computer setup. I happen to be using a Windows machine. You might have an Apple machine. I'd love to give you step-by-step -step details but I can't because the instructions are going to be variable for each setup. So pause here and try it. You can contact me if you're having any trouble. I'm happy to get on Zoom and help you through step by step. But I think most of you know how to install a program, or in this case, two separate programs, R and RStudio. Once those are installed, you'll only need to open up RStudio, and that will automatically open up R kind of in the background. So when you run our studio, you'll see four different panes. And the one we're concerned with is the one, you know, whether I've drawn the big green arrow right at the bottom. That's the biggie one. The other panes are going to be useful in a little bit, but not right at the start. So let's swap over to there. Here we are in our studio. And so I've got running. I open up a fresh file. Now, if you go to the web page that accompanies this, I give a few basic commands that you can step through, copy, paste, and execute. So let's do the first bunch here. Copy, paste. So simple enough, it gives a little red that's just informational. What it's doing, it's creating X as a sequence from one to 50, W as a complicated function of X, then create Y, which is an even more complicated function of X and W along with some random numbers. That's the R norm there. These are given in a basic R help as an example of the cool stuff you can do. Next, let's do a regression. That's these lines here. Copy, paste, paste, I said uh, something like brat. There we go paste. You know, hopefully you know how to copy paste better than me. Hey, it just did a regression. Isn't that cool? Now, you may not even know what a regression is, or you might remember you did that back in your undergrad stats class. That's okay. This is just to get an idea of the stuff that's going on here. Now, you might say, do I really have to copy paste every time? Is there something easier? Yes, there is. If you hold down Control Enter, it will run the line where your cursor is up there. So, yeah, behind my fat head, you can see we just got a cool graph. Now, your graph is going to look a little bit different depending because, you know, random numbers there. Don't worry. So, at the beginning, what you can do is just follow along step by step everything that I'm doing. You can just, like I said, copy paste, run through. Easy, right? Hopefully, right? Now let's do it with some actual data. We don't want to just use fictional made up data. Um, so, Go to the class page, 
and there's a link to download some of this data for the class. We're starting with the household pulse data, the one that, you know, I've circled and put the giant red arrow. Yeah, that, that one. That's the one to download. Now, downloading is kind of a pain because the details, again, depend on your particular setup and OS. The data is usually going to come zipped. So step one is you have to unzip it. It's probably going to get thumped into your downloads folder. And so you got to make sure you pay attention because the downloads folder is probably not the place you want to leave it. R is going to look for the data in a particular folder and you need to get those to match up. Put the data where R will look for it. Now you have to understand a little bit about the directory structure of your operating system and where your folders are. And you know, ultimately you got to find your own balance. Perhaps when you're just starting off, you don't make it too hard. On the other hand, you're going to be using this for a while. So it's a good opportunity to make sure to do it right. In three weeks, you don't want to be back going, ah, why, why did I do this some crappy way when I could have done it in a much better way Then you go back and redo it. Think of this as an investment. But like I said, everybody's computer is going to be a little bit different. So when you load up R, it's going to be looking for files in a particular directory. Oh, remember, minor note, directory and folder are just different words for the same concept. Different operating systems have different terms, but folder, directory, whatever you want to call it, it's a place where the data is going to be located. R is looking in one place, your data ends up in a different place. You got to make a match up. Right at the beginning, you got to understand how some of these different directories work. Now, fortunately, in our studio, there are little helper tools you can use. You can click through, for instance, to load a data. There's a menu item for this, and I'll show you how to do it with some commands. Now, get WD in our studio tells what folder it's currently looking at. Then you can either change where our studio is looking or change where the data is. It's probably good. I would suggest you have create a folder called econ B2000 or something like that. And then have little folders for lecture one or assignment one or household pulse data, or, you know, the, each little project that you do. And then you put the data in there and tell R, hey, look at the data in this particular folder. You can click through, you can do this in various different ways. It's a multi-step process. You download the data, you unzip the data, and then you put the unzipped data into the appropriate directory where you want R to go looking for it. So we'll go back to our studio here. And now if you've done everything correctly, you will have be able to just do load household pulse data W57 R data. And if you're in the right directory, it will just load that up. Great, easy, peasy. Um, now, this household pulse data comes from the great pandemic. I know, hopefully we're all looking at that in a rear view mirror now. But during the great pandemic, the Census Bureau did a bunch of pulse surveys at a pretty high frequency every few weeks. They'd go out and ask people a bunch of different questions. Now the questions changed over time. Different things became a priority they wanted to know about. This data we're using is the 57th pulse done in April, 2023, asking questions like, are you vaccinated? Do you have plans to get vaccinated? Then they're asking if or how many days they're working from home, if they'll get their kids vaccinated, you know, a lot of stuff like that. Then they ask a bunch of demographic information. So we can ask to what extent do some of those other answers change depending on factors like a person's education level? Hopefully you find this an interesting data set to work with. Census did a lot of work to put it together to make it easy to work with. Now I would like you to pause and think about some of those questions you have. You want to be cons considering research ideas. Of course it's early, you probably won't have anything clear yet, but indulge your curiosity and ask, hey, I wonder. I wonder why. I wonder if this would change. All right. Now, what does this data look like? Well, we can directly take a look. Household pulse data. See, it offers to fill it in. 
square bracket 1 to 10 comma 1 to 6. This will show the first 10 observations of the first six variables. Just get an idea. Each row represents the answer from a person. So the first person is somebody who's not Hispanic, is white, has some college but no degree, is divorced, was born as male and currently identifies as male. And then there's a lot more data in the other variables, just not looking here. Next row, row two, again, much the same answers, but married. Row three is a widowed female with an advanced degree, you know, etc. So you could, if you wanted, go through all 59,290 observations and read through all their responses, but life is short. We want some kind of, you know, a summary. Hey, fortunately, our studio has exactly that command. Summary. Household Pulse Data, enter. And it will do exactly a summary of the data. Now, we have a lot of you know, factors here, which we'll talk more about in detail. Um, right? But so we can see what fraction of people report not Hispanic, what people report Hispanic, um, you know, et cetera. You can, can and should sort of browse through the summary statistics. Some of the names are a little bit cryptic, um, but usually you should be able to look at the responses and figure out kind of what the pattern is. So for example, there's this E-EDUC, E-E-D-U-C, for education. I don't know what the extra E is doing there. It's That's how the Census Bureau tends to do things. But this is a pretty common measure. It asks about the person's education and records the highest level of education that they've completed. Some people didn't complete high school. Some people got just a high school diploma. Some people went to college but didn't get a degree. Some completed their associate's degree or bachelor's degree or advanced degree. Census Bureau asked questions like gender at birth and currently how they describe their gender and sexual orientation. Then they asked, do you have kids less than five years old? Kids five to 11, kids 12 to 17. It helps to have some kind of idea of the structure of US society to understand why the category of, say, kids less than five is an important marker, because that's about the age when kids go into kindergarten. Kindergarten is a whole lot of things, but from the standpoint of economics, it's publicly funded daycare. For many parents, that means that somebody will look after the kids for part of the workday for free. Next, there are questions of whether the person got vaccinated, whether the kids will get vaccinated, whether the person got COVID, if they had long COVID, if they're working in what setting, if they have telework, if they have enough food, if the kids have enough, if they're anxious or worried, if they're stressed about inflation, about housing. Note here, tenure means rent or own, about what sort of structure they live in, if they're behind on their rent or their mortgage, if they're likely to be evicted or foreclosed, what state they're in, region, income, kids in school, amount spent on food, amount spent on rent, Hopefully you'll find something in here to be interesting. One of the early things we're gonna do in class is go through this a little more deeply. All right, now I'm gonna end this video telling you a little bit more about R. I know people come into class with different backgrounds, so for some people this may be some too simple, but follow along. One of the useful things that R Studio does is create what are called markdown files. An advantage of an integrated markdown file is when I want to write up my results, if I have a separate word processing file like Google Docs or something, then I would type, you know, for instance, the average value was, but but type, 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 type. And then I go over to my data analysis program, copy paste into the Google Doc. And you know, that, that's fine to do once or twice, but it's not particularly efficient and it's error prone because sometimes, you know, your finger slips with copy and paste. So maybe it drops a digit or, you know, maybe you'll make a change later on, even the most minor change, but you have to go back and update all these and you have to remember each and every place you did it. You know, so it's really inviting errors. The markdown file allows you to have a single program that creates a document. So, one program types the average value was and then says, okay, R, calculate the average value and insert it right here. 
It can do tables, it can do all sorts of good stuff. That's just tremendously useful capability. Now, as with many things in this class, you might right now be saying, yeesh, I can just barely, I'm barely clinging on by my fingertips. I cannot bear to learn one goddamn thing more. In which, fine, fine, okay, you do not have to learn one goddamn thing more. On the other hand, if you're like, hey, maybe, maybe I'm getting this, you know, or hopefully some point down the line you feel that way, then you learn it. One of my goals in this class is convince a bunch of you that this could be a good career. If you find that you enjoy learning this new stuff, then it's an excellent career option. It pays a ton of money. I'm very proud of all the students that go on with a lot less work experience than me, making a lot more money than I do. I'm teaching here in the public schools. Private sector pays a little bit more. Maybe at some point down the line, you'll want to come back and learn this stuff better. Maybe just, you know, put a pin somewhere in your brain, a metaphorical pin. Please do not actually put a pin in your brain. Don't be too literal. But yeah, so you might come back later and do all this stuff a little bit better.